Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, on behalf of the National Transit Institute, I welcome you and thank you for participating. The National Transit Institute develops, promotes, and delivers training and education programs for the public transit industry in the United States. Today's webinar is on TCRP Web Only Document 71, A Transit Agency Guide to Evaluating Secondary Train Detective Detection slash Protection Systems in Communication-Based Train Control Systems. We are pleased to have as our presenters today, Luamar Dedevic, Stuart Landau, Kenneth Dimunch, and Girish Anatha Shankaran. Muammar Dedovic Deda, is an electrical engineer at Jacobs New York City office. His work focuses on systems integration, operations, and maintenance aspects of rail transit systems. Stuart Landau is an engineer at Parsons focusing on signaling and train control for rail transit. He is a registered professional engineer in New York and New Jersey, a member of the Institution of Railway Signal Engineers, and an instrument rated private pilot. Kenneth Dimunch is a CBTC engineer. He has worked on train control systems in Europe and North America, performing such functions as design review, commissioning, and project management. After several, year, several years in the New York, New Jersey area, he recently moved to the San Francisco Bay Area to support a new CBTC project there. He is an INCOSE INCOS Certified Systems Engineer Professional, CSEP. Girish Anathashankaran is a Senior Technical Director at Parsons, focusing on advancing, advanced signaling and train control systems for rail transit. He has been in the signal and train control industry for the past 33 years and currently has a role in supporting NYCT on their Brownfield CBTC projects since the pilot implementation on the Canarsie Line. Today's session will consist of the presentation material followed by a question and answer session at the end. You can participate in the discussion by using the chat pod that is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Um, during the presentation, I will be monitoring the chat and keeping track of the questions. Um, and I'll save them, and I will read them uh, at the end of the presentation. If you haven't already printed out a copy of the presentation that should have been emailed to you, you can click on the handout document in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, up there where it says handout, or you can copy and paste the link in the notes box on the left-hand side of the screen. I will now turn the presentation over to Deda. Thank you, Lori, and thanks everybody for taking the time to join me today's presentation. Um, I'll have the honor of having the opening word, and I'll start with the, uh, with the quick agenda here. So the research team takes a great pleasure in presenting the research findings and the highlights of the Transport Transit Corporate Research Program uh, the 18 guide. Um, the guide itself is, as Lori mentioned, part of a series of publications which are sponsored and uh, organized and provided by the Transit Cooperative uh, Research Program, uh, which, as we all know, uh, has contributed and continues to uh, stimulate the public transportation industry in North America by promoting a wide range of uh, innovative ideas. So uh, here's a quick overview of the agenda. And I do apologize because we use some of the operations because there's so many of them in our industry. So yeah, uh, I do apologize if not all of them make uh, sense, but I will try to mention them all. Um, we have four presenters today, um, and each one will cover um, respective items one through five. I will briefly describe the background uh, of the project and then provide a high-level overview of the CBTC technology. And then Stuart will discuss the considerations uh, for the secondary systems. Uh, and then Kenneth will follow with um, his take on the evaluation decision processes and recommendations. And then Girish will conclude with some closing remarks and upon which we'll uh, open the floor for the questions. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so the official name of our research report was D18, and the aim of the research project was really to develop a guide that will provide a practical approach to evaluating an appropriate level uh, for secondary train detection and protection systems using CBTC applications. Um, the development effort was supported by a team made up of six industry professionals, and four of which are actually present here today giving this presentation. Uh, the approach um, to this task was relatively simple. Um, it involved identifying and selecting a fair sample of representative CBTC projects for evaluation. 
Um, the selection was based on the three basic categories. Uh, projects that are already established, uh, the CBTC project already in operation, um, recently deployed uh, CBTC projects, and projects really that are under development uh, type of uh, phases. And then we looked at the factors, uh, we identified and evaluated the factors uh, which let those transit agencies, the owners, um, elect a particular CBTC system. The choice is why, what, what drove those decisions, um, and whether or not those decisions led to use of um, secondary train detection system or not. Um, as part of this process, we also reviewed a great deal of industry standards, uh, industry adopted practices, um, as well as the emerging industry uh, trends uh, over the past years. And we just tried to combine all these and sort of produce this result. And what we have found in general terms is there are many, many different types and levels and approaches to uh, use of secondary train detection system. And they frankly range from non-existent ones and all the way to a full-blown scale backup system. So as you can imagine, this was a bit of a very challenging and daunting task. Uh, so, uh, next slide, thank you. Um, the, the credits I do, as Lori said, um, this project would not be possible without the um, sponsoring agencies. Um, again, the, the guide was conducted and developed through the Transit uh, Cooperative Research Program, TCRP, which is administered by the Transportation Research Board, TRB, and of the National Academy of Science. The project team would also like to thank transit agencies and the CBT suppliers who participated in the study and, and provided feedback on CBT systems and projects that they worked around the world. The assistance of those two, including the uh, sponsoring agencies, was definitely instrumental in helping us shape this, shape this guide. And next slide, please. Uh, so let me just uh, say a bit of background of what we've done and how we've done it. Um, the work started in February 2016 and lasted for about uh, 15 months. As I said earlier, the approach to the research program was involved a two-stage process. It was one was the, uh, the field research, and then the second stage basically involved development and production of the guide using the uh, results that we found in the field. So the research uh, focused on collection and, and review of literature and standards, and then we followed um, by collection and study of the lessons learned and experiences from a select sample of uh, previously, as I said earlier, completed, currently ongoing, and planned uh, CBTC projects. Uh, those reference projects were mainly North America, Europe, and Asia. As you probably know, those are the three hottest uh, markets that have been uh, active and continue to be very active in terms of the CBTC deployment. So there's a pool of interesting facts that, 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 were, um, that, we, that we were able to collect from those. So the implementation of CBTC presents a number of significant challenges, and we believe there is a significant value in documenting those experiences uh, from the transit agencies and project teams that are involved and how they really went around uh, addressing those challenges and issues. So this just helps not, um, not just learn and understand what those issues might be, but also helps us understand how fully to realize and the benefits offered by CBT, uh, CBTC technology. So as a result of this exercise, we reached out to about 30 different transit agencies, um, and then in the end managed to get responses or had directly visited and interviewed about 20 of them. Um, this also involved reaching out to major CBTC suppliers, and there is only a handful out there, and basically collecting their feedback uh, and getting their perspective on the, on, on the projects, as opposed to getting the perspective from the end user. So um, the research phase also focused on development of case studies. We thought it would be very beneficial to uh, involve um, transit agencies that, um, that have been operating CBTC for, uh, for quite some time. Um, and this part involved, uh, involved collection of information about typical operating CBTC practices and reliance on um, secondary detection type systems. So as a result, the guide has about six or so different case studies on agencies that operate CBTC with and without uh, secondary train detection system. So we believe that this approach gave us the best shot at identifying which are the scopes, what are the factors and considerations that have been taken into the account by decision makers, this, sorry, decision makers uh, during their selection of respective CBD technology. 
and their decisions and drivers for the choices of deployment strategy. And not surprisingly, again, um, we found that those were greatly different between, for example, uh, brownfield and greenfield type of projects. No surprises there. Um, Here's a quick reference to the FTA report number 45. Um, this was, in essence, our, um, if you will, um, hypothesis statement that we were aiming to um, prove or disapprove. Um, and again, in this report and many other industry papers that discusses this subject, um, deployment of CBT technology basically has been somewhat limited within the United States mainly because of this perception uh, that's been lingering around that, that uh, somehow CBTC technology costs uh, more money and that uh, CBTC requires a secondary detection or similar fallback system. So we were set out to um, prove or disapprove this. Um, however, over the past um, decade or so, the CBTC technology became widely accepted and it became a de facto standard for both uh, Greenfield and um, New Start projects and as well for the older charging properties who needed or, or looked to upgrade their earlier older generation of signaling train control systems. Um, and those were mainly driven by factors relating to safety, state of good, state of good repair, and for the operational and capacity reasons. So, over the past years, CBTC has evolved in architecture, design, equipment, and devices, and its overall performance. So really, really, there was an interesting research on our behalf to see how this changed and if we can change this perception around. So on that note, I'm just going to quickly then um, give a high-level overview of the CBTC technology. And there's a, a, a graphic there. Um, and again, I'm going to use the definitions uh, defined by the FDA report 45, and which defines the CBTC as a train control system, which utilizes a two-way communication between um, what they call intelligent trains and wayside computers, mainly for traffic management and control of the infrastructure. And as you can see, there are four major items there. And so let me just quickly start with the uh, train board equipment. Um, and again, they define train as an intelligent train, uh, a train that can determine its own location, uh, a train that can calculate and enforce a safe operating speed without the use of track, circuit, or any wayside signal. So what that means really is that the onboard system is in charge of this continuous control of its speed, a continuous control of its brakes, and all it does all this uh, in, in accordance to a prescribed safety, safety profile. Um, the onboard equipment located in the cabin inside the um, train is also in charge of the communication with wayside and sends this um, status on train speed and safe braking distances back and forth um, between the wayside. Um, the onboard system generally um, composes um, of the vehicle onboard controller, carbon controller, antennas, speed sensors, tachometers, driver display, and other interfaces to um, vehicles, say propulsion and brakes and doors. And then he handles the speed regulation, location of the train, rollback of the train, protection, station stopping, door operation, and so forth. Uh, all of those um, VOBC functions are performed via um, redundancies and uh, checked configurations just to ensure a complete safety. Um, and mentality. And, and these comms, depending on the architecture, it could happen through the radio or inductive loops in some cases. Um, and so quickly just switch to the wayside equipment. Um, and that's made up of the uh, a, a network of the processor-based controllers, and we call them your zone controllers. And these are generally installed along different wayside locations. Um, each, each wayside controller interfaces with the automatic train um, supervision equipment, via data communication network, and then this communicates with trains. Big mesh. Um, the wayside equipment can also interface with external interlockings, um, unless these are part of the CBTC wayside equipment. Some of the automatic train protection functions can also reside within the wayside equipment. Um, in agencies that uh, need uh, determination of movement of the authority limit 
um, for the equipped and non-equipped trains. Um, the wayside equipment also includes any track-based uh, equipment such as transponders, so those are these yellow tags on the graphics, and these are necessary to provide a unique and absolute positioning um, references to the CBTC um, carbon equipment. And the next one in line is data communication equipment, um, basically that links the whole thing together and includes um, equipment located at the control center, wayside locations, the onboard of the train, and this really serves multiple purposes. Um, it allows wayside to wayside communication, uh, wayside to train communication, train to wayside, and communication on board. Um, on board equipment, again, supports communication in, in cases where we have multiple carbon controllers for, for redundancy, for example. And those data links are capable of bi-directional data transfer. Um, and these uh, networks feature a sufficient bandwidth uh, with low latency, and all this is necessary sort of to efficiently support all defined different functions, uh, different functions in terms of supervision, in terms of protection, and in terms of the automatic train operations. Oftentimes, the protocols that these networks use are proprietary, but they don't necessarily have to be, but they're definitely secure, um, as they do um, support uh, delivery of uh, vital train control messages. And the next one uh, in line is the ATS. Um, and this equipment is generally located in control centers and wayside locations. Um, the control of the system is performed from the central command, ATS. And this equipment handles mainly non-vital functions such as identifying the trains, uh, tracking of the trains, displaying the trains on the displays, uh, providing manual or automatic uh, route setting capabilities, uh, regulate train movements to maintain operating schedules, um, and so forth and so forth. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So all those things considered, and I'm sorry if I'm talking a little fast, but we just have quite a bit to cover here. Um, here's the short list of the most notable benefits and challenges uh, associated with CBTC technology. Uh, and again, this has been defined in, all, uh, in different papers and different books. Um, the CBTC offers uh, benefits that cannot be achieved with any prior uh, older generation of signaling technology. Um, enhances the safety um, and train protection. And these are one of the major drivers for the brownfield type projects um, and agencies that are looking to upgrade to newer systems. For example, and this was a major driver for New City Transit and et cetera. Um, increasing level of, increased sorry, level of automation provides better passenger comfort, uh, improved service delivery and system capacity. Um, which is done to optimize the operating speed. Um, automation ensures more regular and guaranteed train launching, um, helps service delivery, and so forth. And um, the lower equipment count uh, improves state of good repair, reduces maintenance, improves power savings, and so forth. And contrary to that, of course, on the other side, there's a fair deal of challenges associated with CBTC implementation, mainly, not necessarily with the technology. Um, and those often seem to be related to engineering processes and implementation. Uh, and those, in the end, can lead to a significant um, financial intelligence. So product incompatibility between different suppliers, um, oftentimes you cannot exchange the equipment between the two. That could be an issue. Um, designs are often site-specific, um, not interchangeable. This can drive the cost. Commissioning integration has to be site-specific again. And um, down the road, once you start using it, um, you have to heavily defend on the suppliers for any future upgrades, enhancements, and modifications. Unlike the conventional systems, um, these require uh, specific input from original suppliers. Um, next slide, please. So here's some sample of uh, CBTC projects recently that's been developed or deployed in the United States. Um, these are the ones that we work directly with um, and the ones that we contribute. And there's a sample of the ongoing uh, projects in the United States, just sort of for your, uh, for your reference. 
And um, with that, I'm just going to um, hand over uh, to Stuart to discuss the considerations. Secondary. Thank you, Data. Good afternoon. I'm Stuart Landau with Parsons. Uh, what do we mean by secondary train detection and protection systems? Secondary train detection refers to the traditional track circuit and the more modern axle counter. Each of these can be used as a secondary or backup or auxiliary system for tracking trains independent of the CBTC train location determination. Secondary train protection includes the conventional automatic block system for train separation and the conventional interlocking functions such as route integrity. These can be either relay-based or processor-based. When used with a CBTC system, the implementation of interlocking principles is relied upon by CBTC. <clears throat> that is, the secondary train protection system is really a primary system and provides CBTC with, for example, route locking, switch locking, and prevention of conflicting signals and routes. SCDPS will incorporate enforcement for safety, and this can be, for example, trip stops to enforce red signals or procedures and rules. In brownfield projects, the legacy method of enforcement may be retained. We reviewed industry literature to see if there were any regulations or recommendations that would give guidance on the level of SPDPS to be used in the CBTC system. Regarding secondary detection, Title 49, Part 236 of the Code of Federal Regulations requires track circuits for various reasons, including train detection and broken rail detection. But Part 236 applies only to federally regulated railroads, such as freight and commuter, and not to rapid transit, although there is one exception. And although these regulations don't apply to rapid transit, rail transit properties may choose to follow them. Standards and recommendations recognize and support the use of secondary systems. For example, IEEE 1474 CBTC standard, which was written back in the early 2000s, covers the use of secondary systems but does not give guidance on what level of secondary system should be considered or whether not having one is an option. We also looked at various industry papers, presentations, and reports, and that is where we see recommendations for minimizing secondary systems. This is a comparison between track circuits and axle counters. I won't go through the whole table, but we'll point out a couple of the important comparisons. Track circuits require more wayside equipment and maintenance. Axle counters are not affected by wheel rail interface, ballast leakage, traction return currents, or poor shunting. When track circuits are used for secondary detection, they may be longer since they're not required to support peak headway. Their lengths are limited by feed power and ballast leakage. Axle counters have no limit on block length. Of course, axle counters do not detect broken rail, but even track circuits will only detect a percentage of broken rail. It must be a clean break, and the track circuit must be known to be vacant. A rail that breaks under a train will not be detected by the track circuit until the train has left the area. And compounding this with CBTC's ability to increase capacity, there may be multiple trains in a track circuit, and the track circuits may be longer if part of a reduced capability secondary system which means the track circuits will be occupied a larger percentage of time, and broken rail will be even more difficult to detect by track circuits. This can and has been addressed with better rail inspections. By having a secondary system, you'll also have failures of that secondary system. Even though the detection is secondary, when present, it is used vitally by the CBTC zone controller, even for equipped trains. A track circuit failure can unnecessarily affect CBTC operation, even when CBTC's precise location determination is working. This requires additional CBTC functions and procedures to handle. As explained earlier, secondary protection is really primary. It's used by CBTC and thus requires an interface between zone controllers and other wayside systems, such as processor-based interlockings. Additionally, CBTC needs to provide overrides to the wayside system. 
to allow the shorter headways that would otherwise be prevented by any secondary fixed block system. All of the above increase complexity and reduce reliability and availability. Based on all the considerations and consequences so far, it is clear that the best option is the minimum level of STDPS that meets the agency's needs. But what if we don't have an STDPS at all? This requires rules and procedures for managing CBTC failures. These include wayside failures, such as loss of a zone controller affecting a large area, or carborne failures that affect one train and impact following trains. Rules and procedures will also be needed to handle work trains or maintenance vehicles that are not equipped with CBTC, especially when running them in mixed mode between revenue service, such as might be required on a 24-7 railroad. Mitigations are agency-specific and may include some level of redundancy to minimize system failures, and either equipping work vehicles or running them only during exclusive maintenance windows. To summarize the disadvantages of secondary systems, we've seen that they add complexity, increase costs, reduce reliability, and require additional rules for unequipped trains or when things go kablooey. On the other hand, STDPS can minimize impact of CBTC failures, allow tracking of unequipped trains, and allow running unequipped trains among CBTC trains. And now Kenneth will discuss the decision process. Hi, everyone. So uh, last part is about the decision process, but uh, uh, before we go into uh, the process that we propose in the guide, uh, we have a few information to uh, to present. So one of the first actions that we did uh, when we thought about the decision process was to categorize the CBTC project and uh, the use of secondary system in, uh, in those projects. So of course, uh, there was an obvious uh, a split between what we said type 1 is the one with secondary system and type 2 the ones without secondary system. But uh, among the one with secondary system, we had different uh, flavor, flavors. Uh, the first one is what we call type 1A. It's uh, the one uh, where the secondary system is able to manage revenue service, whether it's for peak operation on, or uh, off-peak operation. And we presented some uh, visual uh, uh, or graphical display to uh, show the level of um, trackside equipment that uh, the, this uh, type of um, implementation would require. Uh, this was used originally in uh, Brownfield projects. Brownfield projects are uh, re-signaling projects of existing line. I'll use this term uh, uh, in the presentation. So it was used in early 2000s by, uh, uh, early, uh, by um, NYCT uh, Transit or RATP in Paris. And uh, the issue is it comes up almost to doing the, pro the project uh, twice, uh, once for the secondary system and also a second time for the CBTC. And uh, also it leads to more maintenance later on. The second category of uh, project using secondary system is 1B, the one where secondary system is used to manage single non-CBTC train. Uh, single non-CBTC train may be either a non-equipped train, like a maintenance vehicle, or a, an equipped train that has failed and is not able to operate in CBTC uh, anymore. And uh, here there are also different flavors based on the headway uh, that is required for the secondary system. So uh, the important part here is that the signaling system includes some sort of uh, protections, whether it's signals or signals and train stop, and does not rely entirely on operating procedures. Unlike uh, in the next uh, slide, where we have uh, <coughs> where we have projects that uh, rely entirely on operating procedures for a failed, failed uh, train and uh, non-equipped. Uh, uh, vehicles. So on uh, 1B3, there is a secondary system, but it's used only for detection. There is no protection uh, involved. And uh, finally, uh, the type 2 is uh, no secondary uh, system at all. So it's still rare uh, all over the world, 
but and it's been done only on greenfield project uh, so far uh, in the US uh, it's present in uh, GFK airtrain and in Canada for instance one of the first uh, CBTC project uh, uh, was in Vancouver uh, for the SkyTrain so that's for the categorization of uh, CBTC project I still need to uh, provide more information uh, uh, before we go into the decision process and uh, you see later there is a parallel between each of this information and the decision that uh, we will propose uh, later on. So the first is about uh, wayside, uh, wayside, about uh, CBTC failure. So CBTC today has a very good availability, uh, in particular thanks to uh, a redundancy in each subsystem and also having a product uh, line from uh, CBTC uh, vendors. Uh, for the website controllers, uh, when the, the website controllers or zone controllers manage a large area uh, of the network and therefore when there is a failure, it impacts uh, several interstations. Uh, however, uh, the good news is that it seems to be uh, rare, I'll go uh, back uh, on this later, and uh, the recovery is also uh, fast with a reboot is usually uh, sufficient. For onboard controller, uh, the failure impacts uh, obviously only one train. It is a more common uh, failure, but here again, most of the failures uh, for the carbon controller are uh, recoverable within minutes uh, by the train moving in manual mode uh, a little bit and then uh, restarting uh, CBTC operation. That's for the CBTC uh, failures. Now the secondary system failures, are, as uh, Stuart mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, it's important to realize that the secondary system uh, may have an impact on the primary CBTC system. In particular, uh, the track side devices, like track circuit, axle counters, or signals and train stop, because those are in the tunnel uh, open to, uh, to the elements and also they are more numerous. So, uh, as also Stuart said, the, their failure can be mitigated by complex CBTC functions, uh, but there is a cost for uh, implementing, testing, and uh, <coughs> after managing those uh, CBTC uh, functions during uh, the project uh, and later on. Uh, so, now let's speak about the work train or maintenance vehicle. So here I'm, I speak about the track geometry car, rail grinders, high rails for instance. And uh, during the uh, industry uh, research or reach out that we did, we noted uh, all those different options, whether equipping them or not equipping them. Those were the two uh, options. But uh, some projects have used the CBTC trailer attached to the uh, attached to the to the maintenance vehicle, and uh, one project had a separate tracking system uh, for a project for a uh, network who open uh, who are open to the air. They could use global positioning system, for instance. Uh, and one important uh, thing that the industry uh, uh, feedback uh, told us is that there was no direct correlation between the presence of secondary system and uh, fitting of uh, maintenance vehicle uh, CBTC. For instance, uh, Vancouver SkyTrain has no secondary system but did not equip uh, their maintenance vehicle. And on the contrary, Toronto has secondary system but decided to equip their maintenance vehicle. It's more complex uh, than just having this, uh, uh, <laughs> this possible uh, link between the two. It seems to be more related to the ability to avoid mixing maintenance vehicle and CBTC revenue service train. So now that we discussed about all this, uh, we can go into the decision process. So obviously here we have only a one hour presentation, so uh, it's a summary of uh, what is in the guide. We have much more uh, detail uh, in the guide for each uh, step. Um, but let's go, uh, let's go over this uh, now. 
So there was no magic formula. Uh, unfortunately, we would have liked to say, hey, if you have a certain number of train per hour, a certain distance between interstation, it makes sense. Uh, no, unfortunately, it has to be an educated decision tailored to uh, each agency. So we have three aspects, A, B, C. Uh, I'll go over them uh, in the next slide, so uh, I don't describe them here, but uh, those A, B, C uh, will tell us if we need a secondary system or not, and if we need one, uh, then we have to go to the following uh, steps. So oh, let me drink. Um, the first uh, part it applies only to uh, re-signaling project, uh, obviously, because it is uh, uh, it is uh, it is due to the cutting how to cut over the CBTC system. It is related to how to cut over the CBTC system, and um, so there is a strong relation here with the rolling stock project. I, I'll give an example of uh, RATP Line 1 uh, project, which was a transition to a driverless uh, operation. The train did not have any uh, cab, and uh, they could not be delivered and stored uh, all uh, at once uh, in the yard. Therefore, they had to be delivered one by one and put in service one by one. So there was a need to have a mixed fleet operation between uh, CBTC trains and uh, legacy uh, system, legacy trains. When uh, we say mixed fleet, uh, we mean uh, between a CBTC operation and uh, any other type of uh, operation. So uh, sometimes this cannot be avoided, and this leads to having a type 1A, which, uh, uh, which uh, leads to have a full uh, secondary uh, secondary system, but the trend is today is to really to avoid uh, this situation uh, so that we can make uh, the decision on the secondary system about the long-term uh, need for it. So this is the part uh, B, where the long-term use of the secondary system uh, is, uh, is being uh, reviewed. So we have two questions. Do we want a uh, secondary system for backup for revenue service? It's less important if it's for peak headway or off peak headway. And if not, do we want a backup for a single uh, train with CBTC failure? So I have a few, a little bit more information about this. So there was an old perception, which, which now I think uh, uh, we can agree is uh, not uh, uh, correct anymore, that CBTC technology is relatively uh, new. So I think uh, this we could have here 10, 15 years ago, but uh, today, uh, as uh, it was discussed by Deda, uh, showing all the project only in America, uh, CBTC is uh, widely uh, spread. And uh, there was uh, also some uh, uh, discussion about the technology gap with uh, relay-based uh, interlocking. So this is also not... Um, as applicable anymore because a lot of uh, agencies now use solid state interlocking or computer based interlocking so they are already getting used to uh, electronic uh, being present in the technical rooms however there are some uh, real concerns as, as i mentioned earlier the website controllers manage a large part and when they fail the uh, the impact is on several interstation and for the onboard controller failures uh, they may be, so the onboard controller equipment is put in a harsh uh, environment and sometimes also it's uh, fitted on a rolling stock which was not designed for this specific uh, carbon controller which is, uh, uh, which adds complexity uh, and failures later on. So the, uh, let's mention the industry feedback about this. So, for the website controller failure, the mitigation is to have a full system. If you can't operate over a few interstations, the mitigation would be to have a full backup uh, uh, for revenue service. And the frequency is, has been uh, rare on uh, almost all the projects we discussed uh, uh, too. So, uh, so industry now is considering that it's not worth uh, the, the investment. Uh, however, for onboard controller failure, 
the mitigation is a lighter uh, secondary uh, system. Um, the frequency is very agency dependent. Uh, it would have been very uh, useful if we could make, um, uh, if we could have uh, statistics, uh, but it seems to be a really uh, project and, and agency dependent. Some projects have, have failure every day, and some projects have uh, only one failure a month. So uh, uh, we, we could not derive um, uh, frequency to be able to share in the guide, uh, unfortunately. So for this reason, uh, most uh, agencies still consider that it is uh, useful to have a secondary system to be able to manage single uh, fail train. And it's valid for both greenfield and uh, especially for brownfield projects. Um, but this might evolve uh, in the future. And the final aspect uh, is the handling of non-CBTC work train and maintenance vehicles. So I have to insist that this has to be a separate decision than the failed train uh, one to avoid uh, uh, one uh, issue polluting the other one. However, uh, the previous uh, B part of uh, managing single freight train is the most important uh, because for uh, work trains and, and uh, maintenance vehicles, uh, there is a possibility, there is an alternative is uh, to equip them. Even uh, if equipping uh, CBTC, uh, equipping maintenance vehicle with CBTC is uh, challenging, uh, it is a possibility. This also has to be tailored to an agency because it depends on the diversity and quantity of maintenance vehicles. So uh, an agency with a few uh, maintenance vehicles or few types uh, is uh, likely to be able to operate, uh, to uh, equip all of them. However, an agency which has uh, uh, dozens of different types of, uh, of vehicle will not be able to equip uh, all of them. And uh, the key here is the ability to avoid mixing uh, CBTC uh, trains uh, with uh, non-equipped uh, vehicles. So if you can uh, avoid this, then there is no real need to uh, equip maintenance vehicle. And if you cannot avoid this mixity, then uh, you have the alternative either using a secondary system or uh, trying to equip them. So uh, those three uh, A, B, C should be able to tell if you need a secondary system uh, or not. And uh, if, we, if it's needed, and it seems that uh, today uh, most of the agencies are considering that um, they need it for uh, managing single, uh, single non-CBTC train, either uh, for a failed train or for a uh, non-equipped train. Uh, there are different flavors based on the headway uh, that is needed from uh, the secondary system. Uh, we've seen uh, one train per interstation, one train between uh, each interlocking, or uh, just the detection and uh, no uh, signal or train stop. Um, that's uh, also a possibility. So, and this is really also agency and network uh, layout specific. It depends on the positions of the crossover, on the position of the, on the location on, of the yard uh, uh, with respect to the main line. <coughs> so this has to be also tailored. And finally, uh, so if there is a secondary system needed, there is a decision to uh, make uh, about uh, using track circuit or axle counter. And here it's an easier choice than the previous one. Uh, so except for a few projects, and I will go back uh, on, this, uh, on this later, systems which uh, require secondary uh, system for uh, revenue service uh, usually need smaller blocks and use track circuit. And systems which uh, use secondary system for managing single non-CBTC trains uh, are in need of a longer tracking blocks, and this is uh, more suited for axle counters, as uh, Stuart um, mentioned earlier. So there is a, a small ex there is an exception for uh, this uh, last uh, rule, and it's due to um, 
to the broken rail issue. So, uh, like for the work train decision, uh, I would like to insist that we recommend it has to be a separate decision and not start with the broken rail uh, uh, issue because uh, starting with the broken rail issue would lead to uh, using track circuit which would lead to smaller blocks and then uh, would lead to adding a few signals because they are the smaller block the smaller blocks are present so uh, let's keep this as a separate issue as a secondary system and I could make a full presentation uh, about uh, broken rail but uh, let's just uh, keep it to a high level is that track circuit do not detect all breaks but uh, uh, I think we can all agree it is uh, better than nothing. Uh, however, today there are alternatives uh, to using track circuits for uh, detecting uh, broken rail and it is boosting the rail maintenance program to detect uh, defects before uh, they turn into breaks. And it's something I came up to uh, a realization uh, recently. So it's a combination of three things. Uh, the CBTC availability has been good, so agencies have selected a secondary system with longer block, uh, and at the same time, the axle counters also have uh, uh, improved in the past uh, 10, 15 years. They are now more reliable, they are able to be clamped on the rail so you don't have to drill uh, the rail. Uh, they can detect any type of uh, wheels, and soon uh, fiber optic, uh, there will be a fiber optic interface for the data. I don't think it's uh, available, but uh, there have been some uh, demonstration uh, projects uh, on this. And finally, the, uh, rail for the broken rail issue, uh, the ultrasonic testing has become uh, more efficient and more common. There are new tools on the track geometry car. Uh, which are more powerful, for instance, uh, LiDAR technology, which is a very interesting uh, new technology. And also the, there are new software, which uh, asset management software, which can be used to gather a lot of maintenance information and make the uh, rail maintenance uh, much more efficient uh, than it used to be. So uh, here again, this was a, an overview of the decision process. The guide has more uh, detail, but uh, this is what we could present in a one hour time frame. And I invite you to, uh, to read the guide in detail. So next is Girish is going to present the conclusion. Are you still here, Girish? Yes. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Yes, so you've heard the whole presentation, and I will uh, just go ahead and present some of the key takeaways and observations uh, that have sort of been revealed during the development of this guide. Um, as Kenneth put it, uh, there is uh, there is no magic formula for the decision-making process. So what this guide has attempted is to kind of put some structure around the process for an agency to make a decision uh, whenever they want to consider embracing a, a secondary detection system or a secondary detection protection system uh, while going about executing their CBDC projects. Uh, the guide sort of follows a process that is uh, driven by, uh, by key needs of a typical agency uh, when, when they have to be considered for, uh, you know, when they expand into, into the CBDC project. We try to get rid of the subjectivity in the decision-making process to the to the extent possible. I mean, there are there are uh, you know there are very specific needs for each agencies, each each of the agencies, and they matter quite a bit uh, during the decision-making process. So some of the the team had also made some key observations on the on the industry trend that is going on in, in the CBDC area. Uh, First of all, there are uh, only a very few projects with, without some level or scope of uh, STD uh, or secondary systems and protection systems. Uh, specifically, uh, uh, the norm in the brownfield projects, which are existing uh, project lines where CBTC is either being overlaid or CBTC is the choice for uh, upgrading. Uh, the secondary system uh, seems to be the norm. I mean, it's probably driven by the 
the migration and the phasing demands uh, and the demands for sort of continuing to maintain service while the CBDC project is being implemented. Uh, I'm sure there are cases where the original need was different. It was probably thought to help the migration process and then uh, as you go along the project, the agency takes the decision saying that it's not a bad idea to retain the, the secondary system because it also provides as a, as a backup uh, some to, to some level. So continuing with the, with the trend, uh, what, what do we see there? I mean, looking at the summary of projects that, that were looked at and the agencies that were interviewed, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that the scope of the uh, secondary system is getting smaller. I mean, if you were to just look at the North American market, uh, the contracts uh, that were awarded around the time frame of 2010, uh, so for instance, uh, the New York City Transit or the PATH jobs, uh, they, they kind of adopted the secondary train detection production systems for supporting off-peak revenue service. Uh, they extensively used track circuits, which was uh, basically continued from their uh, legacy systems. They were more comfortable with it, and it allowed the mixed mode operation to kind of seamlessly work. Off-late, recent contracts, if you look at uh, what is happening in Toronto, uh, Baltimore and BART, uh, some of these are either uh, awarded or in the process uh, somewhere. Uh, the intention is to use the secondary system only to manage failed trains and to, to you know, manage maintenance vehicle movement. And the, and the trend seems to be to go for the axle counter. As Kenneth mentioned, the larger blocks kind of drive uh, the axle counter division. A shorter block would have driven uh, a track circuit. Um, position. Uh, so if you look at the trend, it is somewhat, it looks like it's appearing to converge to a midway solution with some adjustments in the scope for a secondary system. Uh, some of the influencing uh, factors could be that the CBTC technology over the years has matured substantially and uh, we, we see a lot of stable operation in a, in a lot of large high-density transit projects. Also, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the axle counter technology has improved uh, and, and is being, you know, definitely being used in lieu of track circuits more and more. Uh, so this begs the question, what, what is next? What, where, where does the industry go from here and uh, where is it headed? Will, will we ever um, end up in a, in a, in a storyline where we completely eliminate uh, the secondary system from CBDC projects? Well, uh, based on our study and whatever research was done under the study, our prediction is that it is definitely going towards reduction of scope and potentially towards eliminating the secondary system altogether, uh, even on the high density projects. Uh, but there are factors. What, what, what will it take? Um, some of the factors were, were discussed in the presentation. Um, one is, uh, you know, we need to have a way of improving the management uh, of non-CBTC uh, trains, especially for agencies that run 24-7 operation or close to 24-7. The management of these non-CBTC trains becomes critical. Um, also, how well can the failure of CBDC trains be managed? Um, probably with improvements uh, in, in a more robust carbon controller and carbon uh, controller interfaces, or communication interfaces. Because typically on, on these systems, when the smarts on the train increase, uh, the, the environment on the train is very harsh. And uh, the more robust that system goes, the failure on the CBDC trains goes down. So the confidence in the CBTC project or the system goes up. Uh, we should also we also feel that the, the safety cases for uh, consideration, especially when uh, when the implementation of a secondary system is being considered, should focus on specific uh, production scenarios, and uh, it, it should not be you know it, it should be kind of taken into into fact that the secondary system is meant as a backup, is meant as a, a, a fallback or uh, for specific scenarios. If you generalize the safety case, probably you will end up putting a full-fledged uh, um, secondary system as a backup. And uh, that needs to be weighed in uh, with the agency's safety culture and the, the safety process as such. 
So the other area where uh, for maintenance vehicles, to help out the concept of uh, equipping the maintenance vehicle, the research should probably focus uh, on, on in this area. Uh, again, the, the, typically the fleet for an agency is very small, uh, so uh, getting hold of a cost-effective uh, solution for equipping the work trains or the non-CBDC trains, especially for, uh, uh, for brownfield projects. This is going to be a big factor, and uh, the research should probably focus in that area. So this sort of brings us to the end of our uh, presentation. Uh, we thank you all for listening in. Uh, hopefully it has been uh, informative. And uh, now I guess we will have an opportunity to, to respond to any questions. Probably Lori or somebody should coordinate. Yes, I'm, I'm here to coordinate the questions. Um, I, I think some of the questions that were asked earlier on uh, were already answered. Do you want me to read those, or do you want to start with new ones? I start with new ones, uh, I think, Lori. OK. I think, and again, if anyone's listening and your question was in the chat box and someone answered it or you would like a follow-up, um, please feel free to type it now moving forward, because it did seem like uh, they were being answered as they were asked. Um, did we touch on uh, Raji Alexander? Did we answer his question about, uh, he said he wanted to ask if there were any brownfield projects which have proposed eliminated the STD slash PS. Was that touched on? Uh, yes, but it, it would be a good, uh, a good way to, uh, to uh, re- to say it again is no. Uh, so far, there has not been any uh, brownfield project who has taken a chance to uh, uh, to do it. But uh, uh, it is a probability that uh, in uh, in the future it has it will it will happen. However, uh, the conclusion, the last slide, uh, show that there is still a little bit uh, of work that needs to be done. We are close from it, but. Uh, uh, there's a little bit of work, and there is a, a need for a so bold agency to to say we are going to do it and be the first one. Uh, I think in the railway industry, nobody likes to be the first one to do uh, something. Okay. Um, the next question uh, is from Eric McCalla. It says, what is a good source for train-to-train -train distancing? And the question is on source literature, source not vendor. Yeah, actually have a vendor rather than a literature source. Um, we didn't look at train-to-train uh, -train distancing in our uh, literature uh, research, for, um, uh, but I do have a vendor name. Uh, and someone else mentioned that train-to-train -train distancing was used in uh, Paris back in the 90s. Perhaps there are some papers on that. Um, 1998 Metro Line 14. So it, it, the Line 14 was uh, one of the first CBTC in Paris, uh, implemented in Paris. Uh, so it is a CBTC uh, project. Uh, uh, so I think the term uh, train to train distancing may just refer to uh, what, it, what it is. And uh, so it is a, a CBTC is able to uh, uh, to have uh, what we call moving block and uh, not have fixed block, and I think this is what it is uh, being uh, uh, referenced. So uh, there are many, the IEEE uh, norms 1474 are good uh, literature for um, uh, CBTC um, uh, information. Uh, I would start by this, and uh, also then uh, there are some, many papers uh, about uh, CBTC. I hope I answered the question correctly. Um, he also said that he would take the vendor name. He noticed Alstom on the VTV above. Yeah, I, ju I just I just uh, typed it in. Okay, in great. The chat. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Mandy Katra. In your experience, what's the biggest barrier to equipping all work vehicles with onboard units? Is it simply cost? Well, I, I can take that question. I, I mean, it's not just co cost is basically driven by the volume, right? I mean, the issue has been we've looked at a few agencies where they've wanted to equip uh, trains, uh, work trains, 
the fleet varies quite a bit. And the environment on these work trains is very harsh. So trying to use a standard uh, passenger level, um, you know, hardware equipment and try to fit it into a work train brings its own challenges. And the other thing is the way the work trains are operated. Usually you don't have fixed lengths. Uh, you could vary lengths. You, you could be pushing a train. You could be pulling a train. So the factors are so many to be considered that trying to plant in a, a standard solution for a passenger train service becomes difficult. So that's the functional part of it. And yes, our cost is definitely an issue because the volumes will not justify a, a, a version that is, that is cost effective. So unless there are some uh, quick adaptations of a passenger uh, solution, passenger service solution, uh, you know, the work train thing is a challenge. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Bill Brown. Uh, does the IEEE CDTC standard 1474 provide requirements for the CDTC equipped trailer? If not, would it be a good idea to include it in the next standard revision? Um, I can try to answer this one. I don't think uh, uh, I don't think it uh, it mentioned it, it mentioned the trailer option, uh, and uh, I agree that uh, working on the uh, working on the how to equip maintenance vehicle uh, and having a standard or a recommended practice for it uh, from IEEE would be a, a great uh, a great uh, document. Yeah, I can also add to this. I mean, we've uh, we've tried to look at uh, this option for uh, for a large agency here, and the the, the requirements of meeting uh, you, you know a railroad standard for for a trailer ends up trying to use an old passenger car and try to equip it because the coupling, the the way uh, the harsh environment again uh, that it needs to withstand. Uh, you know, it, and then the, and the, you have to make sure the trailer doesn't derail. So there's a lot of other factors, more to do with the design of the work, uh, the, the trailer itself, rather than a cooping of uh, the trailer. So in the end, what happens is you try to end up designing or, or, or having a trailer which is as good as any other passenger car or, or, a, or an older passenger car. That's that's how things go, and then people drop the idea of a trailer, saying, "I don't want to live with an older car." Uh, and it, it's still under discussion, but this is this is where this is also coming up during discussion. Um, okay, the next. Oops, where did I go? The next question. Um, how how does the train operate when it misses a transponder and establish its location? So when the, when the trains go over a transponder, they get their exact position with pretty much zero error. And between the transponders, they're using onboard uh, tachometers and or accelerometers to keep track of their position until the next transponder. So usually when they miss a transponder, it will be alarmed because <laughs> they're expecting a transponder in a particular location based on their onboard database. And the error that has accumulated so far may be small enough that they can continue to the next transponder. But if the error does grow past a certain limit, they can no longer rely on their uh, onboard location without another transponder, and then they'd have to fall back to some uh, manual mode. OK. So it looks like uh, there's some comments. No, actually, a question. Patrick is questioning the spelling of trailer. I think that got worked out. Um, Callan asks, wouldn't it be cheaper to design a custom controller for work tractors rather than an entire secondary system? Mm. Well, you mean custom, when you see custom control, I mean, I'm assuming a specific custom-based CBDC equipment for work trains, right? Is that, is that, I'm assuming that's what it means. Yeah. But it will yeah. be ex extremely costly to, to do that because, again, it goes down to, the, to a business case. 
uh, you know, the volume will not justify it. You have a fleet of typically, say, you know, you take a take a project. If you have a fleet of say, um, you know, 100 vehicles to do, and the, the work vehicles maybe two for that line. You know, it, it's like you you don't want to customize for a particular uh, particular car. It, 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 the business case won't justify it. On the, on the other hand, yeah, an entire secondary system is very expensive too. Um, but with a reduced uh, or uh, a much reduced secondary system, you could perhaps fit your, um, you know, allow only one unequipped work train between stations or one between interlockings and severely impact revenue service. But if you only do that at certain times or exclusive times, then that's a way around it. Yes in which case you don't need the custom controllers or an entire secondary system. Okay, are there any other questions? I think I got everything in the chat box. If I didn't, please speak up and I apologize. It was hard to weed through the questions that were already answered. I didn't want to repeat them. Oh, Bill Brown wrote a lot. Uh, well, that's directly for Patrick, so um, I don't know if I should read it or just let the two of them chat. Um, looks more like a comment oh, than a question. Describing the, the trailer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any other questions? Looks like someone's typing. Just bear with us a second. They might be typing to each other. All right, should I? Uh... All right, questions going once, going twice. Gone. Gone. Gentlemen, would you like to, uh, any last parting words before I do my little closing here? Thanks to everyone, and thanks to you, Laurie. Uh, to thank you. <laughs> yeah. Th thank you for setting this up. This was great. It was yes, thank excellent. You. Thank you. Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you to everyone for participating in this afternoon's webinar. A special thank you to Kenneth, Stewart, Detta, and Garish for your very informative presentation. Uh, as a reminder to all the participants, you will be receiving an invitation to fill out an evaluation. Uh, NTI greatly appreciates your feedback, so please take a couple of minutes and do that. You should have it in your email, hmm, if not later today, then by tomorrow. So um, thank you, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good afternoon. Bye. Bye.